before I start really telling my story, I want to thank the rescuers, the veterans, because you are all rescuers. Regardless of where you were in World War II, if it wasn't for you, I would not be here. Maybe there would be no Jews if it wasn't for you. Just to give you a few asides before I tell you my story, uh, in 1939, I was born in 1938, but in 1939, um, there were 18 million Jews in the world. One eight million. Hitler saw to it that six million perished. And those who perished were between 1942, when the death camps and the concentration camps were built. It took little less than three and a half years to kill six million Jews. Would anyone like to venture a guess how many Jews there are in the world today? Raise your hand, guess, shout it out. Six How many? Six Today, in the whole world, there are 15, one five million Jews. Now, contrary to popular belief, and you see in the media a lot of talk about Israel, about the Jews, if you read some of the articles in the paper, you know, the Jews own the media. The Jews own the banks. Anytime we have a crisis, it's caused by the Jews. Um, we have gotten this infamous, I guess the word is infamous, title going back centuries. Has anyone here ever heard of the term blood libel? Anybody? Blood libel was something that was created in the 17th century. A Christian child disappeared in a small town. Most of the places in Europe, like in Poland, they were called shtetls. They were little towns where a majority of the people in these little towns were Jewish. So somebody started the story about this little child that disappeared. It was an infant. That the Jews captured this little child and used the heart and the blood in the Passover ritual. I'm 75 years old never tasted blood, never had a Passover ritual with a child's heart and blood. So when people say, why did Hitler succeed so much with what he did in those years between 1938, actually September 1, 1939, and 1945, these were the years from the time Hitler and then Nazis invaded Poland till the end of World War II. If you think about going to church and you hear the story of blood libel weekly, and you are all peasants living in rural Poland, you start to believe it. Now the Jews that were very orthodox at the time did not really mingle with the non-Jews. They kind of stuck to themselves. They were the butchers, the carpenters, the tailors, the shoemakers, and they all dealt with the, their own circle of people. So besides this blood libel issue, besides all the Jews are rich, I'm sure you've heard that term someplace along the way, um, Hitler had an easy time. So when we say and we talk about what happened in World War II, specifically to the Jews, is Hitler had an easy target. He brainwashed the Nazis. We say that the Poles were Hitler's willing allies. And the reason we say that is, I was born in Sosnovitz, Poland, 
and my parents were very poor. We didn't have any money. My dad and my uncle worked as tinsmith. They would make gutters and take them out to the farmers, and that was their business. And they were starting to do business. That was in 1938. In September 1, 1939, when Hitler came to Poland, many of the things started to change for us. In 1935, the Nuremberg Laws were passed in Germany, where Jews could no longer practice their professions. Jews could not work for the government. Uh, Jewish physicians or attorneys could not deal with non-Jews, they could only deal with Jews. The businesses that the Jews owned in Germany uh, were taken away from them. Um, in 1941, on January, actually January 1942, there was a meeting outside of Berlin, which was supposed to be the final solution to the Jewish problem. They couldn't figure out how effectively to get rid of these Jews. Initially, they started by having people packed into trucks. The army guys would know deuce and a half. And they would put gas tubing into the trucks and kill the people in the trucks. But that wasn't efficient. Then they decided they thought they would shoot the Jews. But that was really expensive because they had to waste bullets on the Jews rather than having the bullets for the war. I was about three years old, living in Sosnovitz with my mom and my dad. And in 1942, the Germans decided to move all of the Jews out of Sosnovitz and put them in a camp called Shredula. Shredula was a ghetto and was a staging area where from Shredula they would take the Jews and ship them off to Auschwitz. Um, in 1942, there were 12,000 Jews deported to Auschwitz from Sosnovitz. When I was five years old, in August of 1943, all the inhabitants of Sosnovitz and Shredula were gone, except for 1,000 people. And they were supposed to be shipped off as well. And we were sent to, a, excuse me, to a work camp. Now, children and old people, which would be anybody over 45 who couldn't work, people that were sick, who were disabled, who were gay, gypsies. Hitler had no use for these people. So they were kind of set aside and killed immediately. While we were in the work camp, and by the way, children were the first to suffer. And when I tell my story, my feeling is that it's a miracle, in my opinion, God's plan for me to be here as a survivor to tell you what happened. Because there are people like Ahmadinejad, there are people who are Iranian, Iraqis, people in the Middle East, who say the Holocaust never happened. And to me, it's extremely hurtful knowing that six million Jews perished. I am the last of my family. I would have had 34 aunts and uncles. At the time, actually, 1939, I had 34 aunts and uncles and about 75 first cousins. And today I'm the last of the Mohicans. So when someone says it didn't happen, I want to ask, where are my relatives? They're gone. 
Many of them I never knew. I never knew any grandparents. While we were in Shredula, my mom hid me in the bunker, and she happened to have gotten pregnant, and she had another child, another boy, my brother. And then we had to be moved from Shredula to this work camp, and my mom really didn't know what to do. Um, she had two little kids, and she kind of had to make a choice like Sophie's choice. So she took me with her to this work camp, and I'll explain to you how that worked. And she was able to get some sleeping pills for my brother, thinking that he would sleep for the day, and my dad could leave the work camp, come and get him, and bring him to the work camp. Well, that night, my dad was successful. He went back to where my brother was hidden, but this little bundle that was a year old was gone. And he was told that some woman found him and decided to take him with her to Auschwitz. So when I say my, fa my brother is dead, it's an assumption. I don't know. Maybe somebody was benevolent and took him. Maybe one of the German soldiers, which is very doubtful. Maybe a Polish lady found him and raised him as her own. But he was gone. And I remember when my father came back to the work camp and he told my mom that my brother was gone, I can still hear the screeching and screaming in my, from my mom. In order, to, in order for me to survive in this work camp, my mom would hide me in a suitcase. She would hide me under boots because this work camp made knapsacks and boots for the Nazis. And my mom told me a story that she remembers one time. I told her that while I was under the boots, I saw this shiny thing going by my face. And she said, no, you didn't. I said, no, I did. I did. Well, the shiny thing that I saw going by my face was a bayonet, because the Germans would come in and put their bayonets into the boots, or among the boots, and look if there are any Jews hidden. So for me to survive there is truly a miracle. When I was born, my mom was very young, and there was a woman by the name of Maria Balagova. She was Catholic, and she took a liking to me, and she loved me from the time I was an infant. So if my mom ever had any issues or any problems, she would go to Maria, and Maria would take care of me. My mom befriended a German soldier while we were in the work camp, and he took me out of the camp in a suitcase to Maria Balagovas. I don't know if you ever heard the term righteous. Has anybody ever heard the term righteous Gentile? You want to tell them what it is? Yeah. Um, the one that helps um, all the Jews and protects them um, While I'm talking or speaking, this is not Maria Balagova. I've been trying to honor her for a long, long time. I belong to a Jewish foundation for the righteous. Um, I'll pass this around, but basically, in, 19, in 2005, I met this lady, and she's on the cover. This is when she was young. This is what she looks like now. So I'll just pass this around. Take a look and pass it down, please. Um, Maria took me in in 1943. And for all intents and purposes, are there any Polish people here? She was my babka. Um, and that's how I referred to her from the time I was one, two. I have been teaching the Holocaust at our temple for the last 30 years. And I asked the students, if you had an opportunity to save a Jew, but you know that if the Nazis found this Jew in your home, you and your parents would be either shipped to a concentration camp or shot on the spot 
as a symbol, as a sign, don't do it. How many of you would do it? And of course, I always have a little, I teach six raiders. So there's always a hand that shoots up. Says, I would do it, Mr. Freeman. And I said, you know what? Don't raise your hand and say you would do it. Because even though a Polish lady who was Catholic saved my life, she knew the penalty she would pay and her family, I don't know if I would do it. And I've met quite a few people who are righteous Gentiles over the years, like this lady. Um, and it's amazing when you ask them, why did you do it? And they always have, it's almost like they've practiced the answer because it was the right thing to do. It wasn't the Jewish thing to do. It wasn't the Christian thing to do. It was the right thing to do. And how many of us would do the right thing? And I think we can't answer that question unless we're in that situation. Let me go back to Shradula for a second. You know, people say, well, how do you remember that? You were four or five years old. I think when there's a traumatic thing that happens to you, as a child, if you break a, a hand, a finger, a foot, have a bad cut, it's something you never forget. You'll always remember it. So the things that I remember is, in, I mentioned to you about being hidden in this bunker. I remember the German shepherds, the dogs, barking, loading the Jews into boxcars. I remember the Germans screaming, mach schnell, mach schnell, means go fast, go fast. I remember one time, there was a lady sitting on a barrel, gray-haired old lady. I would probably say she might have been in her 45 or 50. But to me, when I'm five years old, she was an old lady. A Nazi walked up to her, took out his Luger, put it to her head, and shot her. For no reason at all. She was just sitting there minding her own business, other than she was an old Jew. And if you kill Jews, it was like killing an ant. It was no big deal, because they had been so de the Jews were so dehumanized by the Nazis. They were called Untermensch. Anybody speak German here? What is an Untermensch? Yeah, somebody who's subhuman. So if you kill somebody who is equal to a rodent or an ant, it's no big deal. While I lived with Maria Balagova, I really didn't know very much about religion. So my assumption was that I was Catholic because I went to church with her every Sunday. Um, I remember one time she took me to church, it was Easter, and I was holding my Easter basket in this hand, and her hand, and my hand in this hand, and the priest came out and he blessed the eggs, and I remember uh, a drop of water going in my eye. I said, how do you remember this? It's just something I remember. As a matter of fact, when I went back to Poland, I've been back three times. Um, the first time I went because I wanted to see if I could find my brother's birth certificate. I went back to Sosnovitz where I was born. My birth certificate, which I was able to obtain, um, is basically a one-pager. It has my name, Abram Freiman. It has my mom's name, my dad's name, and my date of birth, 3-16-38. My brother's birth certificate is a three-pager because he was born already under Nazi occupation, it's all in German. And his birth certificate not, not only gives his name, his mother, his father, his grandparents, the profession of the parents, the witnesses that were there, it was just incredible. I never really knew my grandparents' names so I had my brother's birth certificate. My parents would never want to discuss the Holocaust. They thought I'd be too traumatized. And I said to my dad and to my mom, I, how can I be more traumatized than what I've already seen? And I think trying to shield me, my dad would 
my dad just wouldn't talk about it. And my mom would kind of say, yeah, I remember, you saw this. I said, Ma, I saw the boxcars being loaded. I saw this woman shot. Um, when the war was over in 1945, I live with Maria still, and I remember her taking me outside to get some fresh air, and I fainted because at night I didn't get much sleep because Sosnovitz was being bombed by the Russians. I was liberated by the Russians. So we lived in Poland for about three months, and then we went to Germany because that's where the GIs were, and that's where we would have some safety. We lived in Germany from 1946 to 1949. And in September of 1949, we came to this country. Uh, we arrived in Cleveland. In order to leave Germany, we had to get a visa to get here. And it's very difficult to get a visa unless, A, you know someone that left Germany before you, and then they can bring you to the United States, or uh, you just sit and wait. So we waited for three years, and we were able to get two visas. One visa on our own, and one was to come to Cleveland, Ohio. Now, living in Germany, have any of you ever seen Fiddler on a Roof? Do you remember one part of Fiddler on a Roof? He said, somebody says, Tavia, where are you going? He says, to Chicago, America. Well, when someone told us we're going to Newark, America, it was no different than going to Cleveland, America. But obviously, we chose to come to Cleveland because at least we knew somebody here. So we arrived here in 1949. I um, didn't speak English. So at 11 and a half, I was put in the second grade. And kids made fun of me, which wasn't very pleasant, because I wasn't stupid. I just didn't speak the language. I didn't have the same clothes that they had. I wore knickers, because that's what I wore in Germany. I also had lederhosen. You know what lederhosen are? Um, there's one little aside, which I think you're going to get a kick out of. While I was in Germany and my parents wanted me to learn English, and I was a total failure, utter failure, I saw these big GIs, MPs, and they were all speaking English, chewing gum, and I said, I'll never learn this language. So my parents hired a gentleman to teach me English, and he had one book. Coincidentally, the book was called Robinson Crusoe. How many of you know about Robinson Crusoe? If you remember Robinson Crusoe, this white guy lands on this island and he sees some people chasing this black guy, Friday, whom he saves. And they were cannibals. Now, when you're seven or eight or nine and you hear black people are cannibals, you generalize. All black people are cannibals. It's called stereotyping. It's like saying, oh, blondes are dumb. You've heard that before. <laughs> Stereotyping. Um, so we lived at 8701 Carnegie. I don't know if you're familiar with the area. It's now a parking lot for the Cleveland Clinic. And there was an elementary school across the street, and a lady took me there, and I walked in, and I think I was the only Caucasian child there. And I saw all these African-American little children, and I started to scream out loud. And I said, they're going to eat me. I'm not going to stay here. So that was one of those little traumatic things. So I didn't go to that school. And it's kind of hard when you don't know and you're ignorant. And a lot of things that I talk about, and one of the reasons I like to teach sixth graders, just as an aside, I spend a lot of time talking about bullying. Now. 
bullying doesn't go on in schools anymore, right? So one of the things that I do, if I may, I read some things to these children, and I tell them, first of all, who can tell me what apathy is? Just raise your hand. Apathy? Ladies, what is apathy? Go for it. Yes, sir. No, 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 no. Apathy is, if I see, let's some big guy. There's a big guy back there, tall, strong, and he finds this little person here, that little kid over there, and he beats him up. And I kind of stand back and say, oh, what a shame. That's called apathy. You don't give a damn. Excuse me. That's the way it is. Apathy is like also being indifferent. So I read several of these essays or quotes to the kids. And I say, one is like, to sin by silence when they should protect or protest makes cowards of men. And that was said by Abraham Lincoln. So I read the ones where they would know the name. So they know about Abraham Lincoln. The no one I read to them is about Albert Einstein, and everybody here knows Albert Einstein. He said, the world is too dangerous to live in, not because of the people who do evil, but because of the people who sit and let it happen. And the last one, and this is a very famous one, was written by a Reverend Martin Niemöller. In Germany, the Nazis came for the communists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Catholics, and I didn't speak up because I was a Protestant. And then they came for me. And by that time, there was no one left to speak for me. To me, it's extremely moving because when we're apathetic, and I see so much going on in this country where apathy just totally fits. When you see a woman in New York City molested and everybody's walking by, looking, and keeps walking, it's akin to being in, whether you're in elementary school, junior high school, high school, and you see someone being bullied and you walk away and don't do anything. You don't tell anybody. Don't approach the guy who's doing the bullying and say, hey, stop it. You're as guilty as the one who's doing the bullying. And this is so important to me. You know, my wife sometimes tells me, someone's going to punch you in the mouth. I get very upset and the gentleman back there would get equally upset. When you think about how many people, how many soldiers, men, women, died to protect the flag. And then when you go to a baseball game and you stand up and you sing our national anthem and you look around, how many people are wearing their hats? And I will tell them, take your hat off. And my wife says, someone's going to punch you. It's none of your business. I said, it is my business. You know, there are people who risk their lives to save my life. There are enough people in this world who want to destroy this country. Someone has to speak up. So if they hit me, be it so. Um, I'm involved in quite a few things dealing with the Holocaust. As I told you, I've been teaching the Holocaust for about 30 years at our temple. I teach the sixth graders. I'm involved with the Ohio Council for Holocaust Education. We have a thing in Cleveland, one year it's called Yom HaShoah, and it's the Hebrew word for the Day of Destruction. And we 
kind of remember the six million Jews who perished. In the Jewish religion, we say a prayer annually to remember the person who passed away. We call it Kaddish. And there are so many people who perished where there's no one left to say this prayer for them. And as we believe that as long as you remember the person who died, they have never really died because their memory, the memory lives on. So this is what we do once a year in Cleveland. It's called Yom HaShoah, and you all are welcome to come anytime. Um, I also go around speaking about the Holocaust, and my feeling is that as long as I can walk and talk and breathe, I will talk about it. Because I want to make sure that if you're either very, very young or middle-aged or older, that you can say, A, I heard a survivor speak about it. Because the survivors, most of them are dying every week. If you think about a survivor, if they were teenagers, it's been now 68 years since the Holocaust or World War II ended. If you were 17 or 18 or 20, you're in your late 80s, mid 80s. I'm 75 and I'm the youngest survivor probably in the city of Cleveland simply because I was a child when it began and I was seven when it ended. So if there's no one to speak about it, I think it's going to come to a point where after a generation or two, someone is going to say, yep, I believe the Iranians who say, or the Saudis or whoever, who says that the Holocaust didn't happen. Um, have any of you heard about the Spanish Inquisition? Okay, I, I do something with my kids also in the sixth grade. I say to them, what happened in 1492? And I said, by the way, when I finish, you all answer it in unison. Ladies, you do me a favor. In 1492, there we go. So all of my students say, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And I said, well, what else happened? Which pertains to them directly. And they sit there and say, I don't know. Well, in 1492, there was something called the Jewish Inquisition, and the Jews were all kicked out of Spain. They went to Portugal, they went to Mexico, but nobody remembers that part of it. And my concern is, this is why we have so many Holocaust museums. Have any of you visited the Washington Museum, the Holocaust Museum? If you walk through the Holocaust, thank you. If you walk through the Holocaust Museum, you cannot leave there saying it didn't happen. And I say two things. One, and some say, what? Thank God that Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. And people look at me like, are you crazy? Why? If it weren't for the Japanese attacking Pearl Harbor, we would have never gotten into World War II. And Hitler's aim at annihilating all of the Jews would have been accomplished. The United States had no desire to go into World War II. There was a great deal of anti-Semitism in this country. Um, have any of you ever heard about the um, St. Louis? The St. Louis was a ship that sailed from Hamburg, Germany, and everything was all set up, and they were supposed to land in Cuba. Well, after being on in the Atlantic for quite a long time, 972 people wound up in Cuba. But there was a change in politics in Cuba, and they said, you know what? We don't want you people. You're going back. So the ship turned around, 
They sat there for a couple of days. Everybody was pleading, doing, and they wouldn't do anything. So they all went back, and most of them perished. The thing that bothers me the most about that particular incident is you all kind of know where Cuba is down here south of Florida. And as the ship was going up the coast, heading into the Atlantic, they went through by places like, give me your tired, you're sick, you're poor. But nobody wanted these people. So as I said, they went back. Um, another very hurtful thing, and please forgive me, I'm, what I'm telling you is the truth. When President Roosevelt had a chance to save several hundred thousand Jews. People in the United States begged him, Jewish people. A survivor from Germany who cut his wrists in front of him tried to explain to him what was going on, the massacre of the Jews. And he said, all I want you to do is, as the planes are flying over Auschwitz, bomb the railroad tracks. That's not to say that the Germans would not have rebuilt them. They would have. But it would have been a couple more months delay in the number of Jews that were sent to the gas chambers. The response was, this was against the mission of the war. The mission of the war was to beat Germany. But of all of the bombers that went over that camp, one bomber could have gone and dropped a few bombs on the tracks. The irony of all of this is, um, what are the white horses called? Pal no, no, no. Palm, what? Lepre yeah, they're Leprezana horses. They're very famous horses. When the GIs heard that the Nazis were planning on killing the, lep the what? Leprizano horses, guess what they did? They detoured and saved the horses. Tells you in the grand scheme of things where the Jews were. Beyond the horses, below the horses. There's a movie that you could probably get at the library or maybe you could find it. It's called One Flight for Us. And the story of the movie is in 19, excuse me, in 2002, the Israeli Air Force was invited to bring their jets to Poland. to show the pride of what they've accomplished in a short period of time since 1948 when they became a state. One of the pilots happened to be a general. He also happened to be a child of parents that survived the Holocaust. And his goal in life when he heard about this flight and that three jets would be going to Poland was to in honor of all the people that perished at Auschwitz to fly these three Israeli jets over Auschwitz. And the only reason I'm telling you is all of this part of the movie is interwoven and it's a movie that has people that became very important people in this country who were on some of these jets, excuse me, the bombers, who took pictures as they're going over Auschwitz and the government knew about it, and they did nothing about it. So I've been rambling on for a while, and I would like to answer any questions that you might have um, about myself, what I saw, some of the things that I've said. May I ask a question first? Gentlemen, where were you during World War II? Yeah. No, the the gentlemen who were in the military. 
Where were you? Okay. Pacific. Anybody in my neck of the woods? Poland, Germany. When were you there? So we were there in 45. You know, I gave a talk about seven years ago in one of the churches on the west side, and there were a lot of people there. And I, when I was speaking, I thought, you know, a lot of these people are not going to believe what I'm saying because I was a child. And thank God for people like you that were there. And they said, what he's saying is what we saw. One man who was in his 80s was 19 years old in the army. Another one was 17. He lied to get in. And they were in Buchenwald. Some were in Dachau. As I mentioned, I went back to Germany three times, and I went to the six, the six of the worst concentration camps were in Poland. It was Auschwitz, Treblinka, Majdanek, Helmno. And going through all these places, and, and Auschwitz, which was the worst, and you see all the hair of the people. You see shoes of the children, thousands of shoes. Thousands of spectacles, eyeglasses. You were at Auschwitz? I drove by it. It was a terrible sight. Um, so, as I said, I'm so grateful for you for having been there because without you, the, my miracle would have never happened. You know, I'm a fatalist. By that I mean, a lot of people say, well, when I was in high school, or before I ever got to high school, I decided I would be whatever. And that's the way my life was planned. I think for most of us, especially me, I didn't really plan my life. I didn't plan to be where I was. I never thought I would be in this country. I never thought that I would graduate with my class being in second grade at the age of 11 and a half when I was 18, going to Ohio State, being in the service. We also have a saying in, in our religion that if you save one life, it's as if you save the world. If you kill one life, it's as if you destroy the world. And for me, it's been very true because Maria Balagova, who saved my life, and no one saved my relatives. I am fortunate to have a wonderful wife, three children, four grandchildren. So because of Maria Balagova, I can say all these wonderful things about my family. Thank you very much. Your parents Yeah. Uh, my mom, I didn't know until much later that my mother was hidden with me. While I was with Maria upstairs, um, my mom was hidden under a coal bin for almost three years. When the war ended, my mom was both physically and emotionally hurt. She had a lot of pain, a lot of nightmares, and she, she was a mess. My dad was in various concentration camps, and he survived. And when the war was over, he came back to the exact spot where he left, which was Maria Balagova's the apartment we lived in. She was upstairs, we were downstairs. And um, so I was fortunate. As a matter of fact, today there's quite a resurgence of Jews in Poland, in Warsaw especially, because as the elderly were dying, they would tell these children your parents, or in some cases your grandparents, were Jews. Even though they were raised Catholic, even though they had no idea that there was any Jewishness in them, a lot of these young people are now turning to Judaism. I met quite a few of them, and they're awesome people. So as I said, um, 
I started out by saying being the fatalist, we kind of go through life and things happen. And that's why I feel things happen and I'm fortunate, fortunate enough to be here and talk to you about it. Yes, sir. Listen. Yes. As a matter of fact, Schindler is buried in Israel, in Jerusalem. And if you go to Jerusalem, you can visit his grave. Now, some of it was embellished. He didn't initially start off by wanting to save Jews. That was like, came after. Initially, he wanted to make money. And then something happened, and he said, you know what? While I'm making all this money, I can bribe all these high-ranking generals, open the fabric that he had, and um, he needed people to work for him. So he decided that he would save 1,000 Jews. There are a lot of people who were like Schindler, but he got most of the fame, if you will. There were people who saved Jews from Japan. Um, you know, when you, when you paint someone with a brush, like, again, when you stereotype or you generalize and you say, all, whomever, it's wrong. But I, it took me a long time to learn that. And, you know, I, I don't want to conclude, but one of the things I want to say is, I hate it like you cannot imagine hatred when the war was over. Um, I hate it for losing my brother. I hate it for losing my cousins. Um, and I said to a rabbi who I knew, and I said, how could God let this happen? And I do believe in God. And he said, Roman, God didn't create this. People created it. Yes, ma'am. And you get to the last state that Americans don't know that you sold it. The last big, huge picture you see is this cigar smoking, Natalie dressed, Theodore Roosevelt. Who knew? And nothing is said, but the story is built to that picture, with your family picture, aside from the horror of the pictures that you see. This is why I'm very touched. Thank you for saying that. Sometimes I think when I talk about President Roosevelt, people are offended because I see movies when he died, all these streets, and there was only not only non-Jews, but Jews in New York crying because President Roosevelt died. Maybe, maybe somewhat in his defense, and I don't want to get into politics, but President Obama is, blame, Obama is blamed for so many things. Um, I have some issues with that. My issue is, and I promise I'll stop, my issue with that is, yes, he is, according to the media, an African-American. Ladies and gentlemen, his mother was white. So why can't he be white with a black father instead of being black and no mention of his white mother? The reason I mention, and again, not being political, not saying he's right, wrong, or indifferent, I'm not even going there. All I'm saying is what you said. If you say something about Roosevelt, you're going to offend all of these people who thought he was God's answer to the United States of America. He did a lot. He did a lot. We didn't know this thing. And that's what's so powerful. At the end, when you, I mean, you can't deny it, and you can't get away from it, and you understand what it means that the most powerful man in the world yeah. But you know, much of it was, yes, he was the president. But basically, the only government entity 
that was willing to help the Jews was the Treasury Department. That was the only government entity. Um, but as I said, it's, um, it's a different day. Thank God we're becoming more tolerant of each other. And maybe our children will show us the way. Because I see my grandchildren showing us the way. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, oh look, a cup. My cup runneth over. <laughs> Thank you. A small. Thank you. Thank you from us. Can I just, in conclusion? Please, yes. I think the library has this. If any of you have ever seen, young people could read this. It's called Maus, M-A-U-S. And the gentleman, Art Spiegelman, did this all in cartoon form. And if, you, if anyone ever does read this and bothers to look through it, kind of the story of my life is in there. Because Art Spiegelman's father was born in Sosnovitz. He went to Shredula. He, w he went to Auschwitz. Um, sometimes when I talk about blood libel, I think people, are, people might think that I'm making this up. But in this book, it's called Hitler's War Against the Jews. There's a picture, um, and it basically says, the front page of a special, the Sturmer, which was a Nazi mag newspaper, headlines reads, ritual murder, the anti-Semite drawing was made by an artist of the Middle Ages to show how Jews were support, supposed to have killed Christian children. The line at the bottom of the page in German says, the Juden sind unser Unglück. The Jews are our misfortune. So this blood libel didn't begin with Hitler. It began several centuries before him. And the last book that I want to mention, and the library doesn't have this, it's called The Atlas of the Holocaust. And Basically, if you have any relatives who are born in Europe, whether it's a small shtetl in Poland or wherever, it's, it's an amazing book because Dr. Martin Gilbert spent eight years going through Poland, Germany, Hungary, Romania, finding all the little places where Jews lived. So, anyway. Thank you again. I really appreciate it. Thank you for letting me be here. Thank you.